Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Gregory Fink, Chair of the Council of Hypertension, formerly High Blood Pressure Research, and we're here in San Francisco at the 2014 scientific sessions of our council. Uh, the meeting um, has come close to ending, and I wanted to provide those of you who weren't able to make the meeting an opportunity to hear some of the exciting science that we've had uh, presented to us here uh, during the last few days. And in order to do this, I've asked a couple of distinguished colleagues to join me and discuss uh, some of the science they've heard and uh, analyzed while, while here at the meeting. And I want to start out with Dr. Chris Wilcox, who is the chair of the program committee for this meeting and is responsible for uh, largely the content of the meeting. And so uh, he is a particularly good person to uh, assess what the highlights were and some of the really most exciting uh, findings that we've had presented at the meeting. So, Chris, thank you for being here uh, with me this morning and uh, this afternoon, excuse me, and uh, I'd like, if you would, to give me, uh, you know, some short summaries of some of the really uh, new, exciting uh, presentations that you, or new, exciting science you've heard about at the meeting. Well, thank you, Greg. I think um, I've been encouraged by what I've heard from the people who are here. Uh, it was a well-attended meeting, by the way. We kept our numbers up and it's increasing ground uh, uh, support in general, so I'm very pleased about that. So I thought I'd briefly mention one presentation under the four headings, really, that we have at the meeting. And the first is an invited talk, uh, which is the keynote speech by Constantino Aldecola. And uh, he is a, an unusual uh, example because he's very successful as a practicing clinician and a, a neurologist. He's at the head of his field in terms of experimental neurophysiology, uh, and he does a remarkably good job of putting the two together to explain uh, current clinical issues. He gave us a very interesting talk on the role of hypertension in dementia. And uh, I think it was most instructive for many of us to realize that even diseases which are primary neuronal, such as Alzheimer's disease, the progression of that, the progressive loss of cognition, is determined as much by the degree of hypertension as by any other determinable factor. So he began to show us some of the mechanisms. For example, it's very fascinating to see that the Alzheimer protein uh, the amyloid protein is actually taken up by the blood vessels and may therefore be part of the uh, pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. Then uh, a second example was from the first day's uh, cutting edge of hypertension uh, review. And Robin Davison, who incidentally is also from uh, Cornell Medical School in New York, uh, gave us a brilliant talk on uh, the... Uh, pathogenesis of obesity-related hypertension. We may think of obesity as being a peripheral problem, a renal problem, but increasingly her research has shown that it has a very important central component in the brain. And specific nuclei in the brain not only show oxidative stress, but also what's evolving as a new paradigm, uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress, ER stress which requires a different set of experimental approaches, a different potential therapy. Uh, and therefore, this, I think, was really a paradigm-making discoveries. Uh, a third example is from the awards lectures. One of the important awards of the Council is the Goldblatt Award. And this is for a new investigator in the field of hypertension. And this was won this year uh, by Mary Kovacin from the Mayo Clinic. She had a very nicely conducted clinical study in which she overfed uh, for two months a group of normal subjects. So that they put on approximately three to five kilograms in weight. And she was able to show that this increased the blood pressure unequivocally, measured by the best modern techniques, and increased the visceral fat specifically. And increasing evidence suggests to us that it's visceral fat gain rather than total body mass or total body fat, which is associated with the complications of the metabolic syndrome. 
So I think the uh, the excitement of this particular uh, in uh, study is that it gives us a new way in which we can, in human subjects, provoke a metabolic syndrome, therefore uh, follow the pathophysiology and try treatment regimes against it. And lastly, uh, an example I could have chosen many from the uh, abstracts that were presented. I was fascinated as a nephrologist with the abstract from Chu Lee's uh, group at Virginia, University of Virginia, which is a collaboration with Jeff Kopp at the NIH and Michael Lipkowitz at my own institution at Georgetown, in which they identified a new gene, uh, MS, uh, uh, GSTM1, uh, which has, uh, is remarkable because uh, it so almost doubles, the abnormal genotype almost doubles the rate of loss of kidney function in patients who already have damaged kidneys. And it interacts additively with the APOL1 gene, which is emerging as the, a very important gene also determining loss of kidney function. But what was particularly exciting about this GSTM1 gene is that it's present in 50% of the population. So it's a common gene with a striking effect on loss of kidney function in damaged kidneys, and therefore uh, gives us a very uh, red light in which to focus new uh, forms of investigation and treatment. So that briefly is one example for many uh, of the different components of the meeting, uh, which, as I say, I've had, in general, um, very good feedback from, and uh, shows us also the example of how both young investigators, like the Goldblatt investigator, and very experienced investigators, like our keynote speaker, uh, have contributed to the program. Chris, I want to congratulate you again, on, and the program committee, on putting together what I think I've heard from everyone that I've talked to has really been an excellent program. Often, of course, people think this program is driven entirely by the abstract, but I think particularly the first day session that uh, focused on, uh, on, on exciting new topics in hypertension is very, very well received. But the program as a whole turned out to have a lot of very, very interesting science. And I really appreciate you uh, coming here to take your time to tell us about some of the things that uh, impressed you the most. So thank you very much for being yes. with us. Thank you, Greg. I've asked Dr. Ortiz to join me this afternoon to provide uh, so a few of his insights into some of the really exciting um, new science that has been presented at the meeting this year. And of course, because of his own particular interest and his council's interest, I'd like him, if you could, to focus on uh, science that uh, involves uh, new observations about the role of the kidney and cardiovascular disease. So Pablo, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, so the, the floor is now yours. Can you tell us a, a little bit about some uh, interesting uh, studies you were able to, to uh, experience while you are at the meeting. Sure, that, there was so much interest in science in this meeting. Truly, uh, I really want to congratulate the leadership of the Council of Hypertension in putting uh, an outstanding program together. Uh, the quality of the science and the quality of the research presented was truly outstanding. So it was uh, very difficult to pick uh, outstanding science, literally every single lecture uh, well presented, well attended, with new data uh, emphasizing the importance of hypertension and also uh, kidney disease in hypertension. I get two presentations uh, that involve uh, the kidney and uh, the development of hypertension, and one of those was the lecture uh, provided by Alicia McDonald, the author from the uh, University of California, and uh, she basically showed that uh, how a small amount uh, of potassium in the diet and have a very positive effect uh, in, in the ability of the kidney to treat sodium and uh, lower blood pressure. As potassium intake increases, there seems to be an inhibition on sodium durable absorption in the distal fluid, that's in part depending on uh, a decrease in NCC phosphorylation. And so her data and data from her group, uh, later presented in the poster session, uh, really show that uh, increase in potassium intake caused a nice naturopathic effect. And when uh, this ion is treated with antitensin 2, this natriuretic effect uh, is not there anymore, suggesting that the pressure effect of ion 2 uh, lift on uh, renal transport predominates over the potassium in the diet. So I thought that was uh, very interesting. And 
and potentially important from a clinical Absolutely. Uh, and so this morning, also in a, a one of the renal uh, sessions, uh, we saw some uh, new data on the potential role of the ghrelin. Uh, it's a hormone that's uh, usually secreted to increase appetite and have diurnal variation. And so we were not aware that receptors for ghrelin are also present in the kidney. Uh, ghrelin was shown to have uh, anti-natriuretic effects by stimulating collecting that soluble portion. Uh, and such, inhibiting ghrelin receptors in the kidney uh, lower the pressure effect of angiotensin II. And so I thought that was a really interesting suggestion that the gradient pathway is somehow involved in the uh, broad hypertensive effects of angiotensin II, in part by enhancing collecting that solid story we have uh, That's really quite, quite fascinating. So was it already known that ghrelin had effects on the kidney? Is that something that's been established previously? Uh, I don't think so. And uh, more importantly, uh, there seems to be a, a, a nice uh, tissue-dependent or cell-dependent distribution of the receptor, with the receptor being primarily present in the proximal nephron and in the collective duct, but not in our nephron segment. Mm -hmm. And with a nice stimulatory effect on inet-dependent soil reabsorption in the collective duct. So that, that's definitely novel. Fascinating. Well, it, it, it's part of what this meeting does is connect up uh, people studying different areas of blood pressure regulation uh, and, and the various factors we know influence blood pressure, like what you eat in your diet, the sodium, the potassium, obesity, you know, obviously feeding where ghrelin is involved. These things do link up, and if we only go to meetings where we talk about very specific topics, those linkages will not be made. So I think that's one important strength of this meeting. One of the reasons I think why it's so valuable to have the, uh, the kidney council here as part of our meeting. Really appreciate you taking your time, Pablo, to uh, come and, and tell us about some of the exciting science. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely.